Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello and welcome today to the Collective Whisper podcast. I am your host, Simon Kay, and we have a fabulous guest for you this evening to bring back some of those nostalgic memories from your youth. But before we get to that wonderful guest, I'd just like to remind you guys, please follow the show and subscribe wherever you see that button. And we hope you're enjoying the show. So on to today's guest. Today, I'd like to welcome Cammie Cutler. Cammie Cutler is an American actress and educator. She's best known for her role as young Elizabeth Walton, which she played in the series The Waltons and the television film The Homecoming, A Christmas Story from 1971, as well as a number of later Waltons reunion productions. Cotler reduced her acting roles while she attended the University of California, Berkeley, earning a degree in social sciences. Her first teaching job was at a small rural Virginia school in the Blue Ridge Mountains, much like the fictional one she attended on The Waltons. Cotler returned to California in 2001, and took a position teaching ninth grade at Environmental Charter High School. In 2004, Cotler accepted the job as co-director of the Ocean Charter School, a position held until 2007, when she started her own educational consulting business. She served as the founding principal of Environmental Charter Middle School, an educational facility in Southern Los Angeles County, California. In addition to working as an educator, Cotler ran her own boutique travel company and managed a San Francisco cafe. She has reprised her role as the youngest Walton child in each of the Walton's reunion movies, and she occasionally makes speeches and personal appearances. In 2010, Cutler was seen on a Walton's Cats reunion and series retrospective that aired on cable network INSE. She's married and has two children. Welcome to the show, Cami Cutler. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to have you on, you know. I can imagine hearing your voice and seeing your face for so many people will bring back lots of nostalgia. And I know in my own family, the Waltons was a staple of our television viewing. And, you know, in those days, you know, you had less channels and less choice. But there was these shows. We used to always look forward to The Incredible Hulk, The Waltons, Night Rider. You know, there was all these kind of shows. I was telling Cammy just before we kind of came on air there, how I've reintroduced The Waltons and Little House in the Prairie to my children and they love it. So it's one of these test of time shows, isn't it? I think that's that's been the most delightful surprise, honestly, was was that we could never anticipate that, you know, 50 years later, people would be sharing it with the next generation down. And now when, when we do an event or go and meet and greet people, I'll have people walk up and, and talk to me. And I'm like, you weren't alive when the show was last broadcast. Yeah. Um, the show was off the air and then you were born. And they're like, oh, no, no, my parents show it to me and my, or my granny introduced me to it and it's super sweet the way that it just continues to be shared on and on yeah that's for sure and i mean even you know seeing your face all those years ago in the show even now you can still see the young elizabeth you know you can you know by your face and it's quite interesting i mean you've had lots of reunions and some walton's tv movies and so on but i think for a lot of people they kind of go oh how long ago was that? Like, was because I think we had this thing when we were watching it in the 70s, 80s, and we kind of felt like it was from another time, you know, like it wasn't, it, we didn't feel like it was in the 70s or 80s because it seemed like, you know, it, it was obviously set in the 30s or 20s, but you always imagine those characters, maybe they're gone now. And then, so it's interesting nowadays to see when you all get together who's still around. But that's I, I'd never thought of it, thought about that part of it before. Um, I know that when people when people meet somebody off the telly, if, if they meet me, I'm always this moment of disorientation. Yeah. I, I, um, my old my old my my previous boss um, at my at the charter school I was working at was it was a fan when she was a little girl, and she actually um, she recognized me during our inter- interview, like when I was interviewing for the job. Like half, halfway through, she's like. Why do I know you? Um, <laughs> why do you appear familiar? Why does it feel like I grew up with you? You know, um, and she used to take, she still does take an enormous delight in outing me. You know, like we'll be, we'll be at a very professional, you know, setting and we'll be having a conversation about education and we're all, you know, grown ups. And then she'll go, does she look familiar to you? <laughs> 
And then she'll eventually tell them, she was Elizabeth on the Waltons. And then the whole room goes, and all these people are really disoriented for a minute because they, and I I wonder if part of it, I mean, part of it is I was on television, but I wonder if if a big part of it is that person is from the 1930s. She can't be in this room right now. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, that kind of makes me laugh because, you know, because the Waltons was like a wholesome kind of family show. If you had been a serial killer in some TV show in the 70s, she wouldn't be saying, do you you know her? You know her? She she killed 17 (laughs) people in the show. They'd be like, I can't quite place her. (laughs) It was such a big show and the characters were so big. And even your character, Elizabeth, was very young, but she stood out so much, you know, with her fiery red hair. And, you know, you, you couldn't but remember her. And I think what it was, no matter what country you looked from, you saw something in each of them or in one of them that reminded you of a friend or a family member. And I think like, you know, in, in, you know, I'm Irish and Irish people probably used to look Elizabeth with the red hair and say, you know, is she, she looks more Scottish or more Irish. So you can tell me later if there's any lineage there, but, but do you get the point what I'm making that people identify with the characters in a big way, don't they? I think people, when they are crafting a television program, are sometimes really mindful of that. Like, how do we, how do we create somebody for everybody? And then if you look at the structure of shows back then, there were often, like, there was a main plot and a subplot. And the main plot tended to be the grown-up plot. And then the subplot would feature one of the children. And in an elegant script, there'd be some sort of parallel uh, learning going on for both the grown-up story and the, the child story. But it, gives you a way for, for everybody in the family to be in the room. And of course, back then, everybody in the family was in the room because we didn't have, you know, iPhones and we didn't have streaming and we didn't have watch on demand. We had typically a television in a living room that was going to be tuned to one of, what, three channels, four channels, maybe? At that time, so, you know, like if we go back, you know, and because, you know, with all the reunions and everything, but if we go back to the beginning of your acting career, you know, how did it start for you? Was it by accident or were you seeking roles as a child? It was very much by accident. My my family and this, my parents and my little brother, we all lived about an hour away from Hollywood, from where the studios were. And my mom had a full-time job. She worked at IBM in systems engineering and marketing. So she had a real career that she was in love with. And my dad was running the, the family clothing store that he'd inherited from his folks. Okay. So everybody was busy. I was in preschool. There was nobody was looking for a television career at all. But my mom happened to take us to a photographer for those, you know, annual photos that you give to your grandparents, those kinds of things. And I was very small for my age, but I had lots of red hair. And I think I never stopped talking. You would have been six that time, five or six? I was five then. And the photographer said she could absolutely do commercial work. Here's the name of an agent. And then my mom says, I pestered her. Um, Mommy, I want to be on television. Mommy, I want to be on television. Mommy. So she sort of said, fine. And she sent like the photos to the agent and the agent called right back and said, we'd like to meet her. Wow. Um, met me and said, bring her, we'll get in touch with you when she's six. Cause as a five-year-old in California, there are lots of laws that protect child actors and the number of hours you can work at five is drastically different than the number of hours. Okay. You can work at six. Yeah. So my mom thought nothing more of it. And then lo and behold, right after my sixth birthday, she got a phone call from the agent saying, we'd like to send her out. Can you, and this is how the industry worked, right? They'd call the mom and say, can you have her in West Hollywood at two o'clock today? Okay, yeah. And my mom's like, hell no, I'm, I'm like downtown working and she's in Orange, she's an hour away from me and I've got, I'm, I have a job, I have things I have to do. And so I think my mom was the only mother at the time who would negotiate with the agent and be like, no, I could have her there tomorrow or I could have her there at four. So she took me on a couple of interviews. She thought the whole thing was ridiculous because hours of driving for her and essentially she'd send, they'd take me into a room for 15 minutes and I'd come out again. And then my mom would say, what happened? And I'd say nothing. She'd say, who was in there? And I'd say people. She's like, well, no, no. And she thought, we'll, we'll give up in a couple of weeks. She'll get bored and we'll just give up. But before that happened, I got a call back for The Homecoming, which was the TV movie that became the series The Waltons. Yeah, that was 1971, um, wasn't it? 1971. So I was six. It was the first thing I'd ever done. My mom had to scramble for like, who's going to watch her? Because someone, an adult has to go with you to the set. So she had to take a week off work. She had my dad to take a week off work. My grandmother took some time off. My uncle watched me like it was this sort of nightmarish child care scenario to get me to the set every day. 
and home again, always, you know, driving an hour, hour and a half each way. So it was, you know, because you have like Walton Mountain and that was kind of say it like I think in Virginia, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then the true location was in the Los Angeles, not a sound studio, but like a, a kind of a, what would you call it? Like it was like an outdoor sound studio, no? <laughs> the show is supposed to be in central Virginia, which is where Earl Hammer, who's the creator of the show, actually grew up and his house is still there. The show was filmed at what was then called the Burbank Studios, but which was the old Warner Brothers Studios. And in Hollywood, old timey movie Hollywood Studios, have a section of sound sound stages for all the interior filming, and then a big back lot with, you know, a Midwestern street and a Western street and a jungle and various lakes. So we were filming in the same place that Music Man was filmed part of it. Yes. Camelot was filmed there. I watch old movies and go, wait a minute, I've climbed that. They, they use similar scenarios and locations, yes. Yeah, it, it's all built already. Ever watch the Gilmore Girls? Yes, yes. My daughter watches it now, actually. You can tell if she if she goes to one of the early episodes when they're first finding the inn, that's that's the Walton house. Okay, okay. So that's the exterior house, which is on the back lot of the Warner's lot. And in the middle of the lot are all these craft houses, you know, with uh, with people who are experts in carpentry and in, in building and painting and in, in plants and botany. And, and they just transform these different sets. Ah. Going in and like ripping off the dormers and putting in different window frames and then pulling out the plants and putting in new kinds of plants. Making it look different and so on. If, you, if you've worked there, if you grew up on that set, you're like, I know that house. That's that's the house I grew up on. Like for me, when I think of the Waltons, you know, you used to come out of the house and you had the barn and the sheds where and it was like they used to do carpentry and different things. Then you had this kind of a, I always remember it was like a windy turn that disappeared around the bushes. So it probably went into another sound lot. And um, and sometimes you would have scenes where they're driving cars, like on roadways and stuff. So that was all on that sound studio, was it? Um, it was almost all of it. Um, about once, a couple of times a year, we would go to a place called Franklin Canyon, which is in the Hollywood Hills. So still in the middle of the city, but it's like a reservoir and it has some, some, some pine trees and things. And then about once a year, we'd drive about an hour and a half north of the city up into the... Um, mountains there and film in a place called Fraser Park. So if, so the okay. the sort of vistas, you know, with like mountains. And just, yes, yes. When they look out over the valleys and... That's all from uh, Fraser Park. Um, and people who, if I meet a botanist, they know that we did not film in Virginia. Okay, but they know by the plants. Because they're like, oh no, those are the wrong shaped trees, and that's not that's not the landscape. I re always remember this one. I think it was you. I, I don't think it was Mary Ellen. I think it was you. There was one scene in the Waltons. I think you hid in a trunk, <laughs> and they brought you to this old cabin, and they couldn't open the trunk. You remember that? Yes, I do. That was that was the second episode we filmed, and the first episode we aired. Um, and I was so I would have been about yeah, I was six and a half, seven. I remember that scene because. It was like another cabin that was like a derelict cabin. But I always was thinking, oh, I wonder, is that like filmed in the same place or did they go somewhere different to do that scene? There were two places where they would film other exteriors for houses that were, that were rural. Yeah. There was a little exterior house set right by the pond, by Drusilla's pond, that they would, they would dress differently for different things. And there, for a while, there was a little house set right across from where Igazi's store was. Yes. Right in front of uh, the pretend cave. There was also an episode in a cave. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. The episode you're remembering was called The Foundling. The Foundling, yeah. The premise was they find a little deaf child on the doorstep. And her, fa her father doesn't want to accept that she's deaf and he doesn't know how to communicate with her. Yeah, I remember it. He, he teaches things that she's, she's a throwback is the old old timey term. And she gets left on the on the doorstep. Funnily enough, the actress who played her mother went on to play the teacher, Mrs. Beetle, in Little House on the Prairie. The, the blonde woman. So that's one of the little... Oh, okay, yeah. Well, it's a hoot. Um, but the, the story that I remember from that 
was um, they reassured me that I wouldn't have to be in the box for very long because I was a little girl. Um, and what I remember from it was like they would open the box between shots and then they would spray me with water to make me look sweaty. And then they'd shut the box again and then shoot the scene of Don Walton, the daddy, trying to find where Elizabeth is. And yeah. so it was just being in this box in the dark and then the lid would open, the light would come in, they'd go squirt, squirt, squirt. They'd slam the light, they'd slam the lid again and then we'd run the scene and then the light would, so it was just, in and out when we they screened that one it's one of the, uh, because it was the first one aired they invited all the families to come onto the lot and to watch it before it was aired and my brother who would have been about five at the time was sitting next to me and my mother said that when elizabeth got trapped in the trunk that she looked over and, and jeffrey's eyes were really big and she he looked at my mom and said does she ever get out you know i was sitting next to him <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. I imagine for you, there was, you know, certain scenes through the years, you know, where your character would be at the front and center. And then there's other scenes where it's John Boy or, you know, there's certain, I'm sure they gave you all like a turn at being the star, no? I think they did. I, I think they did a pretty nice job kind of bouncing back and forth between the different cast members and giving everybody a chance to be featured. I think a lot of times, I have a theory that because it's was one of the few shows on television about people growing up in big families rurally. And I think that a lot of writers who've been working in Hollywood for years who had grown up in, you know, backwoods Tennessee or rural Utah or, you know, someplace out in the sticks on a farm or uh, on a ranch had a chance to write stories from their lives that they'd never been able to write before because they've been writing for Star Trek. Or yeah, and also it w wasn't deeply religious, the show. It was more wholesome. The, you know, you could see their faith was there. But obviously in Virginia and Utah, you know, it's a, a big Mormon community and everything. Was that decision made not to speak too much about the religion, just kind of about the Bible and God and so on? I think it's a fairly authentic portrayal of the religious beliefs of the Hamner family. The Hamner family, yeah. And of people in Central Virginia. I mean, it's clear that we're Baptists. We go to a Baptist church, we sing those hymns. Mother and grandmother, you know, there's lots of reference to biblical text. And people eventually, like when I was a grown-up, I ended up teaching not far from Earl Hamner, from where he grew up. And I, I began to understand that the little community that he grew up in was kind of rough. You know, it was it was working class, working people. There was a fair amount of bootleggers in the neighborhood. You know, there were some real rough folk. And I asked one of his sisters, I said, how did, how did you all turn out so beautifully? College going, like this whole family. She had all those kids in a little house in the middle of nowhere. And there was there was some naughty activity in the community. And she said to me, Mama didn't let us off the porch unless we were going to a church or church event. And those little churches... They kept close ran. Yeah, and those little churches and those communities serve that function. You know, they're, they're a safe gathering place, they're a nurturing community, and they're, they're the way that everybody stays connected. I think the thing about the Waltons and, you know, Little House in the Prairie and those kind of shows and, you know, later Highway to Heaven and those kind of shows especially wasn't... I don't want to say it was like a fantasy land because... You know, you had wholesome families and for lots of families around the world, they may be having their own problems with their own families and with, you know, addiction and drink and, you know, and domestic violence and all of these things. So it was very relaxing and very kind of it took you away from the real world, didn't it, of family problems? Because like sometimes people make reference. I didn't grow up in a perfect home. It wasn't Seventh Heaven or it wasn't Little House in the Prairie. So it's kind of like saying, though, in those worlds, things happen, but never too bad. It was an hour-long television program in a world where pretty much all the problems had to be solved by the end of the hour. By the end of the hour, yeah. Well, that definitely creates, you know, an unreal environment. But on the flip side, the Waltons worried about money. They sacrificed things in order to be able to afford more important things. We were grubby, you know. When I think about other children on other programs who are always really perfectly, their hair done. But like they just let us play, you know, and we squabbled and we so there were there were some really authentic pieces to it. However, like you describe, when people come up and talk to us about the show, either they come up and say, I love the show. I grew up on a farm. I had seven brothers and sisters and it was such so familiar. Or they say, I grew up in a really difficult situation. There was a problem with a parent or there was strife or there was enormous stress and I would escape 
to the Waltons or I would watch the Waltons and think that's how it's supposed to be. I suppose for families and, you know, and now in modern times, we can talk about these things that were secrets and taboo and never talked about. And I think for a lot of people, there was that certain element of escapism because maybe their own family wasn't anything near that or they didn't have the support or, you know, there was lots of substance abuse or whatever. It was a way for children and for even the adults to escape the real world that they lived in and to say, oh, well, this family works hard. They don't have a lot, but they stay together. I think there's some, you know, decent models of like how to parent and yeah. how to have a marriage. You know, there's a lot of things to aspire to. Yes, of course. As an adult, when you look at those shows back, you see the things you missed as a child. You know, you see that relationship, just that human side that maybe you never missed because you were kind of busy watching John Boy writing his books or you were watching the boys chasing squirrels or whatever. You know, you were looking at children things. But then, as you mentioned earlier, there was the thing where they would have no money and they would be trying to get some money. And then sometimes the kids were trying to help them. And the father would be trying to get the logs or it was like a working family that needed to survive all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. I think, I mean, I, I watch it differently now than I watched it as a kid. Like, I'm like, oh, look at, look at what the grown up characters are doing. I wasn't really paying attention when I was eight and watched this episode. Yes. Yes, of course. Tell me then when you came into that world then as, as a six year old and you started filming, I'm sure very quickly it must have become like a second family then, no? Yeah, very much so. We were really, really fortunate who was on our set. And I think it felt like a family. You know, when I talk to people who are the, you know, sometimes have those quizzes, like, are you the eldest or are you the youngest in your family? And how does birth order affect who you are as a person? And I totally relate to babies because of the time I spent on the set with all these older brothers and sisters. But I also relate to the eldest because I was the oldest at home. How many was in your family and your real family? Two. Yeah. Okay. So I've I've had like these two experiences and, and it took me years of like when if I heard that the other kids were, you know, the other actors were the kids, you know. Were the kids, yeah. The other kids were getting together, I would be like, I'm not there. Like, what if they leave me out? Just like I was the youngest, you know, worried that I was being left out and I had to like self talk, like, Hey, you're a grown up now, it's okay. Yeah. The show obviously went on for years and years, but it was reunion. So you would go away from it and then come back. And and the question I'm wondering is because whenever we used to watch The Waltons, it always felt like it was a TV show. But yet there was a lot of TV movies, no? So did you feel it was more of a TV show or TV specials? We were a series. We filmed almost one entire episode every week. So so we, we got there in, in the summertime and we worked all the way through till spring and it was five days a week um, with a deadline and grinding and cranking out television. Would they have like a season or so many shows and then come back for the next season or just continuously kept going? No, the way it worked in, in, in the States then was um, you would film a, you'd film a season, which would be say 20 some episodes. And then they would usually have us film a, a couple more, like certain shows they'd ask them to do a longer season. Um, and then you would break for like a month and a half hiatus, which is when I would just go back to regular school. Um, and then you'd come back in the, right, the summer, bro right as summer vacation started, we'd start filming again. Um, and then that would be it again for the year. When the show was canceled, another network picked us up and made three two-hour movie of the weeks. And then later on again, there were, I think, three reunion specials. So we've made, I guess, six movies, six two-hour movies of the week. Okay. They recently made another um, another version of the, the Homecoming, the Christmas story. So they brought in all new actors. But it was diff different actors or no? They brought Richard back to do the narration. It was John Boy as a man was was by this really John Boy as a young man. And then it was fully cast with, with all other actors all the way through. And they, they said it again in the 1930s and just told the, the homecoming story over again. The problem is nowadays with movies and things, they, they're being remade. And, and sometimes they'll, like, it, it amazes me, they'll take some shows and they say, let's make it a comedy. And you're like, but that wasn't really a comedy. It, was, it might have been tongue in cheek and a bit cliched for the time. But nowadays they say, well, we can't tell it the same way. Like I mentioned that show, I, as a boy, I used to watch Knight Rider years ago with David Hasselhoff. And then someone said, oh, they bring that back as a comedy. I'm like, it, it had its own kind of humor, which was dry. But I mean, you don't, you just should, it's an action show with humor in it. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally know. And, and I, one of the things that dawned on me when they, when they made the, the current remake 
was just how much farther away they are from the time period, right? So when, when we made it, you're filming about 1933, and we were shooting it in 1971. So we were less than 40 years away from that time period. Even the look, I mean, the thing about it is nowadays they have modern cameras and so on. So you get a more pristine look and it has that maybe more real. But in your show, in that time, the look and the camera feel of the camera suited everything. Well, and part of it was that, that we were, again, so fortunate to be working with people who had been significant filmmakers. Play with Heyday, right? So the first few years, our director of photography was um, Russ Meddy, who had worked with Orson Welles and Douglas Sirk. He was an old time movie maker and he knew how to do that. And so the lighting, the set design, like the intentionality about making things look old. Also, back then on the Warner's lot, there was a prop house and a furniture house. And our clothing was often from the 1930s, right? Because they still had, they kept everything. I mean, there were even yes, moments, yes. I think John Walmsley once opened a jacket they'd given him and it said like Wallace Beery inside. So you'd get these old 30s movie stars, old clothing from things they'd once done that would cycle back through our set. So when they tried to do the reunion show now, I mean, the, the remake, First of all, they, they filmed it in Atlanta. They were in a place that doesn't have as much resource as far as filmmaking as, say, Hollywood would. Secondly, they're just 50 years further past the time that they're trying to recreate. More out of touch, less things available, right? And then finally, they work on such a different schedule. Like, budgets are not the same. Back then, they were making a TV series that, you know, 18 million people might watch. Right. Like that was possible. Whereas today, a successful show gets, you know, a tenth of that viewership. I saw actually a post on your Facebook page about how many TV stations are still running. The Waltons are showing it. And I think nowadays what's probably brought it back to life a little bit is the streaming networks, because, you know, maybe some TV stations don't run it anymore. But I think the fact now you can turn on Netflix or Hulu or some stations and, f and say, oh, I wonder, is the Waltons there? Or I wonder, is Little House in the Prairie? And you find it. And then you're like, oh, and you start watching. The great thing, like I did with my kids, was reintroduce myself, but introduce it to them. And you say, we used to always watch this. And like, for example, my wife was showing my daughter Seventh Heaven. You know, this show, Seventh Heaven. And she loved Seventh Heaven. And she, I could see, and the same, she loved Little House in the Prairie. And she loved the war. She got those messages from it. Like she's 12 years old now, but she still watches those shows. And she, I think she just likes that they're nice to each other and they're, you know, there's respect and, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the way television is now today, it's like there's a channel for everybody because there are so many choices. And, and you're, you're right. When the show first went off the air in the 80s, they didn't really show our show. They didn't syndicate in the same way that, say, you know, I Love Lucy had or. Or Dallas. Dallas went on. I remember with Dallas, there was a there was a resurgence of Dallas, I think, in like the 90s, you know, again. And they did a lot in Ireland. Anyway, they had all of these reruns. And it was so funny because I remember talking to some friends I know and they would not be they'd be like these cool kind of guys and they wouldn't be uh, into that kind of thing. But then they'd say, oh, yeah, I'm unemployed. I'm on social welfare but I look forward to Dallas every day. <laughs> <laughs> and then with kind of daytime television, you know? Yeah, yeah. And everyone else is out working and they're slacking. They're watching Dallas. Maybe the Waltons. You no, know, for a while we were showing on like Sunday mornings in England. Okay. I, I, I knew people were like, oh yeah, when I have a hangover, I watch the Waltons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't remind you of the debauchery the night before, you yeah, know? Yeah, nice and calm. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember actually I can't pinpoint what days of the week. I think it was probably the weekend we watched it, more than likely, because it was probably Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings we watched the Waltons too, I would imagine. It, it's always a mystery to us. You know, it was broadcast in the States Thursdays at 8 p.m. on CBS. And I know it was, I know it was shown in England because I was recognized when I was a teenager in England. And I know it was shown in Germany. I was recognized once as a teenager in Germany. And then also there was a, a there was a, a German cable a program that was going to bring the Waltons back and they invited us over and they took us on a tour and we got to do a press thing. It was so much fun. 
that's always what I'm kind of hoping is like, can we get enough people interested in the Waltons that we can go visit and meet fans in all the places that we showed? I think it even showed it in Japan, but under a title like John Boy and His Seven Siblings was the name of the film. Okay, yeah, it's it's like the way they name Spanish movies, different names sometimes, just for the language barrier, and, and it has a more literate meaning. And that's something, because in all those years, you went back to the Waltons for reunion shows and filming the TV shows. Did you get recognized a lot, I mean, when you were in Los Angeles, and, and was it difficult going to school? Well, let's see. When the show was on, on, and yes, I got recognized a lot. So when, during in the 70s, when I was a kid, yeah, like there was a period of time where we sort of stopped going to Disneyland and, and there was some planning around where we were going to do what, what we could do that would be fun that wouldn't get disrupted. It was certainly nothing like it is today, right? Today is, is insanity with paparazzi and a 24-hour entertainment news and all that madness. It was nothing like that. It was just enough where it would kind of get in the way of a dinner, right? Or people are always nice. Walton's fans are the nicest people. You know, they, they don't, they just want to chat for a minute and maybe get an autograph. So they're lovely, lovely people. And that's a huge advantage. And then it kind of got quiet when the show was off the air and I was a bit older. It's always been the case that I was much more likely to get recognized in the middle of the United States than in the big cities. Um, Because we typically we had a stronger viewership there. And now I really, I don't get recognized anymore. Um, but but if we do an event, just not that long ago, we were in um, in Missouri for kind of a festival where they invited us to come out. And I guess five of us were able to, to go. And we just, you know, spent the day answering questions and signing autographs and meeting people. And the line was like four hours long. So there's still loads of people who feel the connection and who, who will, you know, make a little trip to come out. We people come from as far as Florida. I mean, they were driving hours um, just to come remember and, and, and tell us, you know, how the show had impacted them and um, ask a question. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's certainly nothing anybody could have anticipated the way it just keeps going. Yeah, and I imagine every few years there's a resurgence because, like I said, you maybe new young audiences are reintroduced or introduced to it and so on. And then people go down that nostalgic highway, you know, and they, they're like, oh my God, and it's one of those things because it was an iconic show of, of at the time and it developed its own cult status because it you know it brings you back. There's no you look at the Waltons or you look at Little House in the Prairie or you look at any of these shows from your childhood and you brings you back straight away to that time and that feeling being on the couch when you were seven or eight, you know. And I think it I think that's what for people it's a it's a great feeling and and to see, I think in the Waltons, there was a, was a real feeling of family, you know, and their struggles and, you know, the parents trying to keep everybody together and, the, you know, the grandparents still living with them and everything. So it was very close knit, wasn't it? Very close knit. And, and I think, you know, as, as you, when you start to parent, right, there's a certain kind of nostalgia that comes with watching your children pass through the ages that you can remember being. And you want to share with them, like like when they're five, you want to buy them the toy that you loved when you were five, or you want to read them the book or show them the television program. I know we went through that with our kids, like I have to share with them the things that I loved when I was a kid. And then I think too, because there's so many uh, different cable channels showing the show all hours of the day and night, people are more likely to just stumble across it. Like, like you sort of stumbled across it and you're like, that's right. I remember those days. There's iconic moments in the show, you know, towards the end of the episodes when they're sitting around the radio or, you know what I mean? Where it's kind of, yeah, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Richard Thomas, who played John Boy, is currently touring the United States playing Atticus Fink. Uh, Atticus, sorry. Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird play. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, And he says that every so often he'll be in the theater and he'll be being doing the play and you can hear somebody go, yeah, I mean, that that line, that's right. This lives forever. I remember, you know, just as kids, you joke, you make that joke. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, Elizabeth. You know, there was there was always that like little dialogue they had that every brother and sister had themselves it, over the years where your parents are like, be quiet, go to sleep, you know, <laughs> you know and then probably some more rude ones. Shut the fuck up, you know. <laughs> But but the thing is, it, it it's something that we all have done where we're like we're trying to um, run away from the night, you know. You're still trying to make the day longer. You don't want to sleep, you know. 
And um, yeah, exactly. And that was kind of with that, it was nearly like they were just hanging on and then it was saying their good nights and everything. And people made a joke of it, but it had a deep kind of lasting impact, didn't it? Well, and think about how genius of, of remembering something from your own childhood, which Earl Hamner had to do, which was the fact that he grew up with, you know, all these brothers and sisters in a tiny house, house, such a tiny house, the real house. And you said that house is still there, no? Yeah. Wow. It's in Schuyler, Virginia. It's a little, um, I think it's called three bedrooms and one bath. Um, it's like, a, it's not really a two up to a down, but it's, it can't be more than 1200 square feet, that house, that house is tiny. And and they would say goodnight to each other through the walls before they went to bed until their father said. And it, now it's kind of a museum, no? Or It is a museum and also like a like a inn where you could rent it out and, and spend the night in it. And then right on the street from it is a is a brand new building where a woman called Carol Johnson has built the replica of the Walton House. So the one that you see in the television, he's got the same front porch. She's got um, she's been collecting for years because she's, she's a huge fan. You know, the furniture and the. the dishes and those props. She finally finished building this bed and breakfast and she named it John and Olivia's Bed and Breakfast. She invited cast members to be the first guests. We got to go and spend a night there and we got to have dinner at the dinner table and we commented it's the first time we'd ever eaten a real meal at the table. So we'd have lots of like, you know, you know, eat and pretend to eat and then have it back in the room, shoot it over again and then scrape it back in the bowl and put it back on your like pretend meals. Oh, you, you were like hungry pretending to eat. Um, and trying not to eat too much because you don't want to get stuffed because you're going to film this scene for the next, you know, three hours. Um, but to actually sit down and like eat a meal from beginning to end naturally, we'd never done at the table. And it was funny too because when we finished, um, when we finished eating. We said, "What, what, what do we, what do we do with the dishes? Like, where do we rinse the dishes?" She pointed it at the sink because she's recreated the Walton's kitchen, including the sink. And on the sound stage, that sink didn't work. It was just pretend and if they needed they needed water to run through it they would just rig a hose and a bucket and just do it you're like no we never washed them on the show we're not washing them here <laughs> it never dawned on us that we could turn the turn the thing and the pots and the water would come out that doesn't even cross our mind. one thing when we went on to have breakfast one morning when i woke up really early it's what what bowl should i use and she just pointed to this rack of dishes that had been on the set. Yeah. But I've never touched them. They were props. You're not allowed to touch them. That's amazing because your kind of muscle memory was making you do everything you used to do on the set, even though you were in a real house. Muscle memory to the point, on the soundstage, the interiors were all on one level. So they were, they were had false walls that you could move, you could place the camera. They didn't have a ceiling, so you could hang lights and move sound. But they were just pretend. And when you went up the stairs from the kitchen, you went up the stairs and turned a corner and there was just a dead end, with like, you know, three bits of drywall and a platform. And you just stood there really quietly until the scene was over. And each one of us, when we climbed the stairs at the inn, where it really is a second floor, each one of us went step, 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 pause and stopped where the stairs ended on the soundstage and then had to like force ourselves to continue up the staircase. Because there was a real staircase. That's how deep the muscle memory was. I watched every single one of us do it. You know, like during the filming of, of the episodes and the movies and everything, I'm sure, you know, there was there was a lot of hard moments because it's, they're long days and, and you were filming in Los Angeles. So I'm sure there was times it was extremely warm. And even that time, I know you were in the trunk or the chest and you were being sprayed, but I'm sure it was, it was some difficult days too, no? Long hours. Yes. Uh, I think it was in California, there are labor laws that protect child performers. So you aren't allowed to act. You aren't allowed to be at work for more than eight hours. So if you come in at 730, you're done by 430. You have to have an hour for lunch and you have to, uh, school is in session. They have to let you go to school for three hours, part of that day. Okay. It's still a long day though for a six-year-old, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the, the production company hires a specially permitted person who's a teacher and a social worker. Their job to both teach you the content you're supposed to learn in your grade level, and then also make sure the laws are enforced on set. So for example, if Elizabeth was in a sort of stunt-like situation, like if I was falling off something or she fell off a lot of things, um, and, and my teacher would come out and keep an eye and make sure everything was safe. Um, and if I got close to the end of the day, like let's say I'd come in at nine and I had to go at six, and I was in a scene that was still filming at 5.30, 5.45, my teacher would show up on the set and be like, 
you have to pull her at six, it's the law. So those those sorts of protections. Get it done or use earlier takes or something. I want to talk later, obviously, about each cast member and stuff and your relationship with them. But did you find yourself being drawn more, for example, to, you know, John and Olivia or the grandparents or how was that kind of relationship? And I think we, we were together so much. You know, we spent more time together than actual families spend together because we were together eight hours a day most days. Um, and I think think you end up being close to everyone in different ways. I can say that when I was very little, David, who played Jim Bob, and I would play together. So when I was seven and he was, you know, 10, 11, we would play. Um, we used to play Bonnie and Clyde. We used to go rob the bank um, on the out. There was a bank set. There were usually old cars parked on the, on the Midwestern street. So we would pretend that we were driving them and we would rob banks. Um, we'd go to the Western set and have shootouts at the saloon and like pretend we were cowboys. And so we played really, really hard and mostly unsupervised. When I think back on it now as a grown up, I'm like, who, what was going on there? We just disappeared and no one ever said anything. Um, but it was super fun. Um, and then as I got older and, and David got older and didn't want to play, you know, hide and seek anymore, then I began to follow Mary around, who played Aaron. She was a teenager and she was. Mary is pretty different from Aaron as a character. Like Aaron's kind of prim and prissy, and Mary is a hoot. Really fun, to, so really, really deeply amusing human. So, so I would follow Mary and, and, and watch her be funny and, and hope that she wouldn't get annoyed by me and make me go away. One thing I used to always notice was when, when you watched it, I mean, everybody is kind of central and everybody is, um, you know, focusing on them at different times. But a lot of the time, there was a, a strong focus, obviously, on on Jim Bob, or, or not Jim Bob, but um, John Boy, and um, but also Mary Ellen as well, because they were similar age, and they were kind of like when they'd have moments of rebellion, or he would talk her down from the ledge, and vice versa. But there was a lot of emphasis on them too, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, Richard was the show's star, um, and in fact, the story is that they asked Henry Fonda if he wanted. To- play the father character and that he read the script and said you do have a star already like the kid is your star it's not it's not going to be the father but he said no to the project because he really felt that it was about john boy he's the narrator and it's framed through his his recalling richard is a sublimely talented actor yeah he's very good and and he as you said he had that unmistakable voice and it was very calming and soothing and and he told that story so well like he was wasn't just an older man narrating the show he was talking and he was in the show and everything so it was a it was a great find wasn't it well the 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 narrations for the original series are actually done by the creator of the show earl hamner why earl hamner did that's right yeah so that's why you have that fabulous old virginia accent that's right yeah now that you say it then john boy would do some narration too no i think that he usually did any narration Typically, the narration would just bookend. There'd be a narration at the beginning, a narration at the end, and then you'd have the episode run. I think maybe what it is, and, and this is probably one of those crazy things, is now that you've said it, like it's Earl Hamner's voice, but from your memory, you just think it's John Boy. Yeah, it is just uh, John Boy as an adult, yeah. I did it in my head, no, it was John Boy speaking, but you're right, it was Earl Hamner. Well, and if, when I think about it, the show was very much conscious of um, what is John Boy perceiving, right? right. Well, a lot of times when when things were happening, the director and, the, and the, the filming was done in such a way to make you aware of John Boy was noticing what was happening. And I think that almost acts as a narration because you have this centering character who's noticing how his mother and father treat each other, who's noticing the, the play between grandma and grandpa or grandpa and the Baldwin ladies or whatever is going on. So there's a lot of, of his perception it's kind of built into the way the story is told. There's a lot of like external characters that are not in every show, but they're there. And they're fabulous. You know, played by amazing, amazing actors. Um, Nancy Tucker, who was played by Robert Donner, Godsey and Corabeth Godsey. Or we're so lucky. At that time, like when you consider those two shows, Little House in the Prairie and The Waltons, there was a lot of similarities. And I think even as children, when you look back, sometimes you even mix up some characters because like, for example, with Little House in the Prairie, there was the characters, Nellie Olsen and those people, but the older people in the community. And sometimes you think, was she in the Waltons or in Little House in the Prairie? Because there was similar kind of ideas, different towns, but sometimes the characters 
They seem very similar, wouldn't they? Yeah. I think the first time I met Melissa Gilbert, who played Laura, I said, I said people ask you, and she's like, yes. But we, we'd, we'd both had the experience of people being, I know who you are. You're Laura on Little Hoffman Prey. I'm like, no, I'm Elizabeth on the Waltons. And she'd had the same. I saw, I think, it, and you were thinking you went to Laura Ingalls' house, no? I grew up reading those books. I was reading those books as a little kid and read them over and over and over again. I was a pretty voracious reader. And, and so when I went to see uh, Laura Ingalls' house in Missouri, I, was, I didn't really watch the TV show because cause I was I was always bothered at how it was all different than the books. I knew the books so well. Anything that wasn't the same was like, ah, no, I was just very conservative about that. But I had trouble watching Little House because I was such a fan of the books. Little House in the Prairie, I think, like if you compare it to the Waltons, it was sadder, wasn't it? Because it was, you know, there was some tragic things happened in Little House in the Prairie, you know, with, with uh, Albert and Mary went blind. And, and so there was, I know there was, I suppose in, in the Waltons, there was no, was, was there, there was no real death, was there or no? I, th- I think the tragedies that we had to incorporate had more to do with the actor's real life. So Will, Will Gear passed away when the show was still being made. So we had to incorporate the fact that Grandma had died. Then, of course, Ellen Corby, who played Grandma, had a stroke, a really significant stroke in the Grandma series, and was able to come back and work as an actress with aphasia and other issues coming from her stroke. But you see, I think what it was, if a, one of the younger characters had passed away, would be a, it's a bigger hole. But when they're, when they're the older actors, you know, people are thinking, oh, are they still alive or whatever? So it's, it's more expected, I think. It's- I feel like Little House was a little bit more melodramatic than the Walton. Yeah, probably, yeah. It's like an artistic choice. Like when, That was Michael Landon's program, and, and I think he was doing that kind of, like, that was how he wanted it to be. I remember reading as, uh, something that said, when Little House at the Prairie finished, Michael Landon burnt down the house. Yes, he, he, he burned it all down. Yeah, he burnt it all down, and I think it was like, that was the end. And I think that the, the, the actors that we had... Um, Ralph Waite and Michael Learned and Will Gear and Richard Thomas and Helen Corby, you know, most of them had had really extensive theatric, like, like theatrical careers, like in play. Michael was coming from the, um, the American Conservatory Theater. Richard had been working on New York. Ralph had been trained in New York and working in New York. It's important to them that things were real. And there were definitely times when the scripts were a little melodramatic or, um, unrealistic and they would they would really put their feet down and say no it's it's not realistic there was an episode once where i think a salesman comes to town or something and he wants to buy his daughter a doll but he can't afford it and somehow elizabeth has ended up with this doll and the script had elizabeth give the doll to the man to give to his daughter and michael said she wouldn't do it this is seven year old girl she would think about it but she wouldn't actually give it away and it's a better story if you see her think and go no i'm keeping my doll more human funny about about michael learned the mom you know is i always remember my mother when she was younger she looked a bit similar to her wow but then the thing is i always think as well that maybe that's just kind of nostalgia and wishful thinking that i could say it to somebody oh i think she looks a bit like her mom and they might go no but what i'm saying is as children you look up to those parents as well you know to the, the mother and the father and you develop this yeah. keen kind of um, affinity with them and so i think that's what happens as kids you idolize them but you don't realize it and then when you're an adult you kind of like you look at michael landon's character you look at you know ralph wade's character and you think yeah they were really strong men and women who really had an impact in your life as a child. Mm, interesting. So for me, I'm fortunate to have like the best mom ever. My, my real mom is so smart and so sensible and just really was a fabulous mother. Partly, I think, why I was able to be in television, be in Hollywood and, and not have any relations with it because she always made it really clear that it was my, my hobby. And if I didn't want to do it, I was fine with her. It was kind of a pain in the ass to like get me to work every day. And if she could simplify her life and just keep me at the local school and not have to worry about transportation and special events, and that's fine with her. I think that helped me know I'm doing it because I like it, not because my parents want me to or any of that. So I was very fortunate. But I was also fortunate because Michael Learned is just the most willing and empathetic person you're ever going to want to meet. But there were definitely times like in my teen years when I'd get all like, Oh, what was me? And my mom would say, have you tried talking to Michael about it? 
Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense to me. She, you know, my mom's thinking, this is just weirdly emotional, and I don't, I don't know what her problem is. But Michael's really sensitive. Maybe she can help her. It was true. I could bounce back and forth between these two women who were both really remarkable in their different from each other. Did you have favorite brothers and sisters? Or did it change over the years? How many brothers and sisters do you have? There was six children. So I, I'm the second youngest. Okay. There was a younger sister than me. And then there was four girls and my older brother. You know, when I look back, my older brother was five years older. So at the time, I think just at that time when I was starting to get to know him, like at 12, then he left. No, like because he was 17, 18. It's interesting because we obviously had a big family too, not like, but so you see similarities in the relationships, you know? Right. But for you in that, like when you were filming it, did you have particular actors who you kind of felt were like more like your brothers and sisters? I think it's the same as any big family, right? Which is that, that there are all kinds of dynamics at play. Like I think the dynamic you just described, which was just, was just as you were getting old enough to like make that connection, the brother who was five years older, golf and you didn't get a chance to like keep moving it so because of the age differences i think as i grew up i kind of discovered each one of my walton siblings in different ways if that makes sense and, and when we get together now it's even better because we're all grown-ups you know actually we're all old so no you're not old you're just older so when we get together it's just fun you know you no know, it's great because i was just looking through the cast i mean you no know, and i know I was watching a, a YouTube video of you did an interview with uh, Judy, you know, Judy Norton. Mm -hmm. It was great. And, you know, the thing is, like, everybody's obviously older looking, but you can still see their face in there. You know, that like, you still see them. You go, oh, like, that's why you said earlier, people go, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> How do I know you? I mean, the gesture stays the same. You know, like, there's, there's certain ways of being yeah. that individual people have that, it's like if you ever skip to see video of like your parents when they were before you were born and you're like, oh, wow, that's that's still my parent. I mean, that's weird because they don't look like that in my imagination. But even if like, I watch some old Super 8 footage of my dad when he was like 14. Yes, yes. And he's still he's like, it's still my I could see my dad. Let's talk a little about, you know, like other things you've done, because I know from your IDMB and on you've had uh, like a few things like so tell us about other st stuff you did after the waltons or during the waltons acting career was pretty short i'm mean, not short it was long for 10 years but it was you know i did the homecoming when the homecoming ended um i did a movie of the week then i did a, a little comedy series called me and the chimp which lasted for, yeah me lasted for 13 weeks was canceled and was also featured in a book called the 10 worst television series ever thank you Oh, God. Oh, it's a point of pride. And then um, and then I did the Waltons for all the years. When the Waltons ended, I was 16, 17. So just basically going into my last year of school. Um, and I was able to apply for a special program that lets you go to college for your last year of school. So you finish whatever courses you're missing for your high school diploma. And then you also take freshman classes at a university, living at a university. Which was great because I'd never really been to school for a full year. I'd always had a show in the middle of the school year. If that makes sense. That's the difficult thing, isn't it? When, especially when you're a child actor, you can see where people uh, they don't. It's not that they get disillusioned, but maybe as they grow older, they want to do a regular jobs or teaching, like you did, or different things. So, is there a point where you thought, "I don't really want to do this as an adult"? I don't think that it was like a single point. I think that um, it had never occurred to me to go to college and study acting because I had this very kind of workmanlike perspective on acting. You know, learn lines, hit mark, find key light, you know, get, get dialogue right on first try. Like that was, was kind of how I saw it because, you know, we were grinding out a television series. There wasn't a lot of time. Was it difficult to learn the lines or? Memory is like a muscle. If you use it, it gets better. And, and I think... I'm a word person, like I remember words, but it was never hard for me. In fact, if you watch The Homecoming really carefully, um, my mom had reviewed my lines with me and I learned everybody's lines. So if you watch, sometimes my, my, my mouth will so I'm saying other people's lines along. With I'm going to use that as an interesting trivia fact. And like people, I'll be like, I'll say, you see, look at her mouth. Your mouth moving. She's saying their lines. They're like, you're talking rubbish. Where are you getting that from? I said, well, the lady herself told me. 
Yeah, it's true. I watch it now, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, you see it more than anybody. So then let's kind of talk then, you know, in the profession you're in now or I, that you went into later, teaching and stuff. You know, you were in school and then you, you know, decided to go to university. At 16, 17, did you kind of know you wanted to become a teacher or what did you kind of plan to do with the rest of your life? I didn't have a plan. Almost never have a plan. That's a that's a personality trait. I went to school. I took classes that seemed interesting to me, which were often literature, history, anthropology. And then I stopped going to college for a while and traveled. I lived in, in England for a couple of summers and just called it my extent, extended summer vacation because I'd never had a summer vacation because I was always working. So the show was over. I'd finished high school. I had a year of college and I just traveled for a while. And then, um, and then I went back to college, uh, went to UC Berkeley and um, ended up kind of focusing on American studies, like American culture and literature and history, intellectual history. So I was interested in like what makes Americans Americans. And then thought, I don't know what I want to do next. Why don't I get a teaching credential? Because that will enable me to live in different places in the United States so I can learn more about the stuff I'm interested in. And I got my teaching credential and ended up moving to uh, to uh, rural Virginia and teaching basically in the same kind of community as the Waltons was said. It was just a massive accident that it happened that way, but it did. So here I am a city girl, right? I go off to the Blue Ridge Mountains and learned about, you know, people who hunt and, and, and uh, uh, these pigs and, and make moonshine and all the things that, that referenced in the Waltons, but I don't actually know anything about. So I learned a lot there. Eventually, people found out who you are and so on. They did they kind of think, well, you must know about this. <laughs> no, they, they mostly thought I was crazy. Um, students would be like, "What's wrong with you? Why are you here?" I'd always say, "Because I find it really interesting." They're like, but you, you were on television. Like, why don't? That's really weird, Miss Collar. That's really weird. Yeah, they couldn't figure out where you were coming from. Why would you come here? Yeah. You'd be teaching in the Hollywood Hills. Well, I tell them you guys are really, and they were interesting. Like my students were so fascinating. Like, I remember going on a, well, we went on this nature walk once, and every time I saw a flower, I'd be like, "Look at that! I wonder what that's called." And they're like, "It's a weed, Miss Collar. It's just a weed." In a way, you had that naivete, and they were cynical. They were like, "What's the big deal?" Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Like, I, oh, I might hear I've planted a garden, and I know there are deer, and the deer might come into my garden, so I'm researching how do I keep the deer out of my garden? And here they they don't like human hair. I have all these things. And finally, one of my students like, it's Connor, I'll shoot it for you. I'll shoot it for you. They were probably like thinking, she's like this weird hippie lady or something, you know. Yes, absolutely. And and they were more, they were more like, you know, realistic about things. And if it's bothering you, you know, I get rid of it. I'll shoot it. Yeah. We can eat it together. <laughs> but it was, you know, and I always say, I think any teacher, like their first three or four years of teaching, they learn more than their students. Yes. Of course, yeah. That's just inevitable. And you learn so much more about life and yourself, too. You learn a lot about yourself. Um, if you're going to be any good at it, you have to learn a lot about yourself. No, of, of course, of course. And you stayed in education. You were teaching ninth grade and then you were a co-director and so on. Did you kind of find yourself moving more from the classroom to the office and administration? Yeah, I think, um, again, for me, there's the never a plan, um, all accidental. We moved back. We moved back to California because I wanted my kids to know my parents, know their grandparents. I'm clearly living in the middle of nowhere, Virginia, going to make that very difficult. Um, so we came back to the city. Um, and then my kids were in school, and um, I was really looking for options for my son because he was he was going to a very good little elementary, but he was not thriving. It wasn't a good fit for him, and that got me kind of uh, visiting different uh, public schools in LA that are that schools you can choose. So charter schools in California are funded just like any public school. They start on enrollment and then they teach all the same standards that the, every traditional district school would teach. And they have credentialed teachers and they take the tests and all of that. They just have more flexibility in terms of how they, um, how they run their educational program and how they teach. And so there was a group of parents founding the charter that looked interesting, and I started volunteering as another parent on the committees. Because I'd worked uh, as a teacher in a charter school, I had I was useful. Um, I'd be like, wait, wait, yeah, that's illegal. That won't work. Or there's, there's a solution. And I and when we started, when we got to the place of opening the school, we couldn't find anybody to run the school. Um, and other people on the committees were like, you should do it. I'm like, no, I'm not qualified. I can't do it. No, no, you should just do it. And we, we got closer and closer to opening. There was nobody to do it. 
So one of the other parents who was on other committees and I were like, what if we share it? Like, we'll do it together because you're good at things that I'm not good at. And we'll kind of like support each other and get the school open. And then while, while we're running it temporarily as the co-directors, they'll find a real principal. Um, we did that for three years before we told them we're leaving. You have to find a real principal. I see then as well, you were also, you know, you had your own travel boutique and a cafe and things. Did you find then, like, as you know, your working career went on, you wanted to try different things too? Yes, and, and I like to work because I'd always worked. So when there were periods that I didn't have a job, I just felt antsy, honestly, just uncomfortable. Um, so I would often be like, okay, what? Well, I was looking for somebody to do something. Because I'll do it just so I can go to work every day. So when I was working at the restaurant, it was that kind of job which was great fun. I learned a lot. It's very interesting to hear what people are doing now. I mean, after those careers, like on TV and stuff, because for some people, they kind of go, it must be hard to settle back into normal life, especially if you're very famous, you know, if like Macaulay Culkin. You know, it's very hard to be normal because you probably still have paparazzi. But it's nice when you're like, in your case, where you could be noticed, but you could still get on with your life. Yeah, very much. I like working and I like, with people and I like solving problems and I like figuring out how stuff is so that I can, yeah, I, I like being on television. And I always say like when you're starting a charter school, not that different than starting a TV program, right? You're working with a group of people. It's important to you. What, it's successful. Things happen that you didn't anticipate or expect and you have to like think on the fly how to fix it. And then when you're done, you have a school and kids can come to it and have hopefully a, a really meaningful experience. So that just feels good right yeah that's really good and so you know going back to the waltons then do you think you know because they made that other kind of like a type of remake do you think that you guys will ever get together again and do another one with all the original people no idea never up to us right it would be up to to the production company side that they wanted to do that i can't imagine how it would work because we are all a bit older than than the last time we did it and ask it could be you know like that show that 70s show uh, did a remake out uh, 90 show where all the characters are coming back with their children out of the characters so it would be very interesting if the waltons came back with their children and you know yeah hard to imagine people will often say because elizabeth never got married in the show she she got engaged and she had a boyfriend people will say oh i want to if they just do an episode where Elizabeth marries Drew, and I'm like, Elizabeth, like, actors are now in their, like, late 50s. But Hollywood is a great place because, you know, if Bobby Ewing can come back in the shower, anything can happen. <laughs> that's true. And, and and that's why I don't say no. I think anything can happen. You never say never. So I never say never. I think sometimes the fellow who's producing the, the remake, which is on the CW, he was so, I think, surprised how uh, many Walton fans, like, responded to it and sent him, you know, criticisms and concerns and because it was so important to so many people. One of the things he one of the things he did say after he made the first one was that he was gonna look for ways to bring back original cast members in, in like guest starring roles. Right. So even you know, sometimes what happens is with remakes they bring in Hollywood actors or people who are well known, try to fit roles of people who weren't well known when they went on the show and you just grew to love. And then you kind of go, how can Dwayne the Rock Johnson be, you know, uh, John? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> or like, uh, you know, they put in the completely wrong people. So, would be, I mean, of course, it's nice, I think, for, for the fans and everything, and even for you guys to come back every so often and do another show, or isn't it another movie? It's nice. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, we have fun working together. And, and the dynamic is always there. If you put us in a room, to warn people, like if somebody's doing, a, say, a charity event and they, they decide they're going to invite you know, five of us to come and, and they're like, so here's the schedule. We're going to do this first. There will be a like, VIP sort of cocktail gathering and then we're going to screen something and have a and a And I'm like, just to build in time, we're going to start talking to each other. When you get us all together, having our own family reunion while you're trying to produce your event, you have to remember. They'll be like, we're not exactly sure how this part's going to go. I go, don't worry, we'll just take it over. So we've been doing it for so long. Do it. Don't worry. Don't worry. I was wondering then, for you then, you know, do you have any kind of aspirations for the future? Or things that you kind of want to achieve still? Or, uh, you know, what, what kind of things can you tell us about Cami Kotler's future? Well, you, as I say, I'm terrible at planning. So um, 
I, I'm still, I think I'm kind of in a transition, right? I'm not working full time right now in education. I'm, I'm consulting and helping the schools that I, I started help to open. And so I'm doing that, which has been really fun because it gives me a chance to kind of pick and choose the projects that sound most fun. And I'm also looking at having just recently been on a couple different Walton events at different parts of the country, really thinking like, there are fans out there that would love to get together and like we just have just reminisce and tell stories and and reflect on on childhood and the show and 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 how it moved people and moved them. Um, I'm just looking for ways to create more opportunities for people to do that. So often, if we do an event, there are people who can't can't get to it, right? So like we've done events in the states and people in Ireland and England go can't afford to fly to you know. Virginia or Los Angeles or Missouri to see you all, but I would so love to join you. So we're always thinking, well, how can how can we get there so we can make it more accessible for the fans that we have all over? But it's hard to please everybody. It's such a big world, isn't it? Yeah, but it's fun to visit, you know? Yeah, of course. This conversation is fun. And, and anytime we go places and meet fans, we always meet lovely people. And we always have a, like an extended Bolton family reunion, really wherever we go. The great thing is this, like when, when I release this show, you know, you, I'm going to have lots of Irish people that are going to be like, oh, my God, you know, this will bring back such memories. and great memories for them as well so you know and i want to thank you for coming on and it's been a pleasure talking to you and it's great to hear those little bits of trivia and how you made the show and relationship with everyone and how your life has progressed and changed over the years so thank you very much it's been great fun for me thank you for inviting me and, and i look forward to hearing how you're building your bits of trivia and people are watching Homecoming with you in the future. Of course, of course. I'm going to pull it out of my secret weapon. Cammy Cotler from the Waltons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cammy Cotler. That was a pleasure talking to you. And it was really nice hearing all the stories about the Waltons and about your childhood filming in the Blue Ridge Mountains, which actually was in Los Angeles. But for all of us, it was in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it, it brought me back to all my childhood memories of watching shows like this. And, you know, I think, as I said now, for my kids, it's something that they look forward to and they enjoy as well. So it's, you know, a show that is timeless and, and will always be there for everybody for years to come. So, you know, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And it was interesting to hear about your life then and now and for the future. Well done on everything you've done and best of luck for the future. And to you, the guests at home, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the content today and I hope you've enjoyed Cami and listening to her stories. And we look forward to hearing you on the next show, which is coming soon. And until then, my name is Simon Kay. This is the Collective Whisper podcast. And until the next time, take care of yourself, your family and your friends and everybody, all the people you love. Bye bye.